Hi, everybody. Doug Jenkins with the Finlay Hancock County Chamber of Commerce. Happy to have you with us uh, as we have more consumer education and uh, information for small businesses heading here into the holiday season. Uh, another piece of uh, educational material for our YouTube channel. I'm joined by Ryan Lippy with the Ohio Attorney General's Office and also a special thanks to Ann Spence from the Attorney General's Office. We've had quite the series of events so through that office so throughout this year and what an interesting year it's been. Uh, but uh, Ann helped us set this up probably about a year ago. So uh, thanks to Ann there. Uh, today's topic is consumer scams and Ryan Lippy from the Ohio Attorney General's Office is joining us. We're going to go back and forth on this presentation. I'll have some questions for uh, Ryan as we go through. And uh, of course, uh, plenty of information for you. But Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll uh, we'll get on our way here. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be here, even if it's not in person. It's great to virtually be in Hancock County. Um, I'm sitting here in Columbus and it's really uh, wonderful to be able to at least communicate online with everybody out in the field. Um, as you probably know, the Attorney General's Office provides legal representation for state agencies. We do not give legal advice. We're not allowed to serve as lawyers for individual consumers or anything like that. When we sue, it's on behalf of the entire state. And uh, But we do do a lot of services, public services, that I want to help um, clue everybody in on so you know when you might want to call our office. And I'm particularly with the consumer protection section. Um, one thing that I usually try to do is give people some excuses to learn about other parts of the office as well, because believe it or not, we've got 33 or so sections and about 1,500 people in the office. I That's include you. That's quite a few. So do I know everyone? No. But um, but I know a lot of the people in our section. We're about we're at about 70, 75 people right now, including complaint specialists, lawyers, um, all the investigators, uh, everybody all in, support staff. We're at about 70. And um, we've got a couple people in Toledo and a few people in Cleveland, but the vast majority of us live in, in or right around central Ohio. Um, we do a lot with um, the other sections of the office sometimes. So I'll tell you a little bit about the other section, a few of the other sections. I'll cherry pick a few that I think are important for the public to know about. Um, crime victim section, if you're ever a victim of a violent crime, you may be due compensation so they can come in and talk about um, how that compensation works and who might be eligible. Um, unfortunately, being a victim of a consumer scam doesn't make you eligible. It's really victims of violent crimes, but um, there are some recourses for victims of scams that we'll talk about. Uh, charitable law section, as we get into the holiday season, it becomes a really prominent section of our office to let people know um, how to be a wise donor. And they take complaints of, of charities that may very well be scams. Obviously, most businesses, most charities do the right thing and they're legitimate, but obviously there's bad apples out there. That's what charitable law does. Uh, the healthcare fraud section does really important work. They enforce the Ohio Patient Abuse and Neglect Act. So if you see something wrong with an assisted living center or a, um, a uh, nursing home, a facility like that where there's group living, the healthcare fraud folks are the ones you probably want to talk to. Um, they also do a lot with Medicaid fraud. They bring millions of dollars back into the state of Ohio, and they're usually nationally recognized year in and year out for the amount of money they bring back to taxpayers that's waste and fraud and just abuse of the Medicaid system. Oh, I had no idea about that. Yeah, so since Medicaid is a joint state-federal program, it's up to the states a lot of times to find the use and abuse and what's going on and getting to the bottom of who's stealing money out of the system. So we do a lot of work with Medicaid fraud through our um, the healthcare unit. Um, things like civil rights section, I mean, they can talk about housing discrimination, employment discrimination, things like that. A couple really important parts of our office are law enforcement related. You may have already heard of some of these, like OPADA, the Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy. They do uh, law enforcement training, advanced training. They certify all the basic training instructors, all the basic training facilities. 
and BCI, the Bureau of Criminal Identification. Um, they do a lot of missing persons cases. They deal a lot with uh, DNA analysis, handwriting analysis, um, fingerprint analysis. And if you've never been to their any of their field offices, um, you may want to stop in. Uh, if you call in advance, maybe you can even organize a tour for a group of BCI at their office in Bowling Green, which yeah. um, is a fully comprehensive crime lab. It's a really impressive facility that was expanded about when I started with the office seven years ago. So I've been to the Bowling Green facility and uh, I think I've been there. I've seen a lot of schematics of it. I know I've been to their headquarters in London, Ohio, back down in the southwest part of the state. So we've got lots of different, um, lots of different sections all headed up by our attorney general. The 51st attorney general is Dave Yost. So he's the former auditor for the state of Ohio. He has a lot of um, a lot of background in prosecution. He served as the Delaware County prosecutor for years and an otherwise great person. But um, we're all led by him. He oversees the entire office. So what is consumer protection and why am I here? Um, we ensure that it's a safe marketplace for consumers. So we enforce laws related to buying a used car seeing a store advertisement, home improvement work, and sort of everything in between. Our, our biggest issue, uh, just by volume right now, aside from all the scams we deal with, is uh, motor vehicle issues, buying a used car, buying a new car, um, lemon law issues that are mostly new car related, um, mechanical issues, repair shops, things like that. But uh, we do an incredible amount of complaint handling through our informal dispute resolution process. So that's a long way of saying that even though we can't be your personal lawyer, we can, on a non-legal basis, informally work your complaint against the business. Whether it's a small business or a large business, whether it's you know halfway down the street or literally around, around the world through the internet, we do a lot of complaint handling for folks and just help them see the consumer point of view. Now, we can't force businesses to make a good decision, but a lot of times when they hear from our office, they'll listen a little closer than when that consumer was trying to speak up for themselves. Um, again, most businesses do the right thing. Most businesses don't have complaints filed against them, but when they do, they hopefully take it seriously, especially when our office is involved we have a long history of getting money back or at least getting some result uh, that the consumer feels good about. And if um, it's a Better Business accredited uh, institution, we usually go to the Better Business Bureau, tell them what the situation is, let them try to work it through their complaint resolution first. And then if all else fails, we can handle it or the consumer is left to go to small claims court or municipal court or common police court. Uh, but again, we try to get we try to put those complaints on the front burner so that we don't have to deal with the legal system um, and the consumers don't have to spend the money for an attorney or the filing fee at small claims court. So a lot of what we do is IDR. That's informal dispute resolution. Uh, we took about 22,000 complaints. Um, we'll be at that number by the end of this year. Last year, it was about 21,000 complaints. So we're up a little bit. Um, those are the complaint categories that we hear a lot about. As you see, motor vehicles is that number one status. Um, we we'll see lots and lots of other uh, complaints in other areas of, um, of our economy as well. And as you see, identity theft is number eight. And we're gonna talk a little bit about identity theft later in the presentation. But we actually have an identity theft unit where we can pair up a consumer with a consumer advocate in our office and actually help them uh, get their identity back, get their good name restored. We've had a ton of success and I think it's an underutilized service of the office. So we really, really try to impress upon the fact that we can do some of this legwork for consumers if they are in fact a victim of identity theft. We can contact creditors, debt collectors, credit reporting agencies, and do some of that work that otherwise uh, consumers spent, you know, sometimes months or longer 
uh, dealing with a mess where someone is using their social security number and opening up account after an account, abusing their name and uh, running, bringing up a pretty costly bill at the end of the day. So those are our most common complaints. And I have a feeling that um, it's probably gonna look very similar for 2020. We do have an economic crimes unit because a lot of times people wonder whether we have any criminal authority to put folks in jail. And the short answer is our statutes are mostly civil in the consumer protection section, but we do work with local prosecutors. We work with local law enforcement, county sheriff's offices, and we have a really good relationship with those throughout the state of Ohio. And that's a lot of that is because of our economic crimes unit. That's where they do go criminal and they help local authorities identify, investigate and prosecute consumer fraud of a criminal nature. So that's where things can lead to jail time. And that's only with the authority that the local prosecutors and law enforcement have. So we can, they can um, assign us the case and authorize us to prosecute or we can work hand in hand with them, do all the leg work and then turn it over to them. However we wanna work it, um, they do a lot of really important work for the office in terms of those crimes that are, you know, those crimes that do deserve jail time or probation. Um, these are our poster children right now for the economic crimes unit. Um, on the left is, Hers is Bruce McFarland and on the right is Herschel Mumaw and they ran a home improvement racket in central Ohio. They, they were out of Pickaway County, so around the Circleville area, and they did a home repair scam where they scammed 25 older adults out of about $137,000. Wow. And case by case, they went up to the homeowner and they uh, promised to do work. They went door to door, which we're always telling people to be cautious about. If someone's going door to door, they may uh, may not be legitimate if they have to resort to that tactic, especially in the home improvement market. Um, so yeah, stick with those that you know have a good reputation, and don't put a large deposit down like these thirty, these twenty-five older adults. Put a large amount, if not the entire amount, of the invoice as a down payment at the request of the Circleville gang. And so uh, not only that, they um, didn't do the work. So they went around and claimed that the checks had been destroyed or lost and they had all these older adults while still promising to do the work, write second checks. So that's how they got up to nearly $140,000 in losses by older adults that just suspected that these were ordinary home improvement workers trying to find and, and make a living. So uh, they did no work, they did no work. So um, Bruce McFarland is doing, I think five years and um, Bruce uh, Herschel Muma is doing seven years. I think it was six and seven years in these cases. And then some of their accomplices are on the right side of the screen. They are doing everything from probation to three and a half years in prison, depending on their culpability. But you better believe with home improvement folks, there are this, this model is being replicated throughout the state and throughout the country. Ohio is certainly not unique to uh, home improvement scams. So we just warn everybody to uh, do their due diligence before hiring somebody if it is a door to door um, kind of relationship. Don't put a lot of money down. Maybe put a third as the total invoice. A third of the total invoice is a down payment. Save a third for the middle of the job if it's a big job, and save as much as possible for the end, so you know the quality work has been done to your satisfaction. And uh, a lot of people ask me about this case whether we were able to get money back. I think in virtually all these cases we try to get restitution for the consumer and try to get them. Uh, to get their money back. But a lot of times the money goes overseas. A lot of times the money is dried up by these folks and their spending habits. So unfortunately, it's not every single case that we can get 100% of the money back to the consumer. And in the scams we talk about, 
Uh, it's even worse because a lot of these scammers funnel the money around and use money laundering and use techniques to get the money overseas quickly. So I would say our track record of getting money back in the more anonymous scam um, part of the market is is not not good. I mean, generally, if you use a uh, MoneyGram service, Western Union, prepaid money cards, those are kind of the currencies that scammers like to use that we deal with. That money is usually gone once it's been picked up by somebody at their location, which again, maybe even overseas. So that leads me into some of the common tactics that outright scammers use. If they are asking for Western Union or MoneyGram or a vanilla reloadable card or an iTunes gift card, beware. That is, that is what scammers like to use because it's fairly anonymous and it's difficult for a consumer to get their money back. It's not really well traced once it's picked up at its source. So uh, there have been um, plenty of times cases involving uh, some of these wire transfer institutions, some of these businesses, but uh, beware if somebody asks for that type of payment method. Uh, if you're using an Amazon gift card, it should only be used at Amazon, not somebody that's calling you up to try to get you to pay off a debt or not somebody that says their grandchild's in trouble, anything like that. Um, you want to use a credit card. If you have any, if there's any skeptical notion you have, use a credit card for transactions that you may not have um, gone through before. And we'll teach you about more of the red flags, but if it's something you're doing online and you're buying something from a new business or a business you haven't dealt with before, always best to use a credit card because that provides you the most consumer protection in the event you don't get your item or something goes wrong. Uh, if they request a lot of personal information, that can be a red flag, especially if you know they don't need it to uh, process the transaction. Pressure to act immediately. You know, they gave a lady 45 minutes in Delaware County um, last year. I, I, there was a case where they gave her 45 minutes to pay off a debt. And she was talked into it, and they were very savvy, and they talked her into thinking she was the, she was the one that owed money, and they were the ones that they, she owed money to. So they gave her 45 minutes, and they told her she would go to jail if she didn't act immediately. So when you see like when you see pressure like that, don't give into it. And that goes for charities as well as um, scammers. They'll put pressure on you so you don't think clearly, so you don't do research, so you don't talk to anybody about it before you give them their money or whatever personal information they're looking for. So pressure to act immediately is definitely a red flag of a scam. If they request to keep the conversation a secret. That can be a scam red flag. Guarantee to make money. This is one of my favorite ones. Now, you know how much you make in a savings account these days at the bank. Very little, interest rates are very low. If somebody's trying to tell you you're gonna double your money or you're gonna earn 20% in six weeks or something phenomenal, it's probably too good to be true or there's some risk about it that they're not telling you about. So guarantee to make money is one of these red flags where I wish it were true that you could just go get a government grant for nothing or for being a good citizen, but it doesn't quite work that way. So we see grant scams and we see um, investment scams like that. Request for a large down payment. We already covered that with uh, the case of the Circleville gang. No contract or nothing written into the contract. A lot of times scammers will tell you to take their word for it, or they'll tell you that there's a bunch of blanks in the contract, but they promise to fill them in when they get back to the office. They don't want to waste your time. Those are the kinds of cases where you say no. You want everything written down. You want promises in writing. And if they refuse to do it, you can take your business elsewhere. Um, even if it's something like a free car wash at the car dealership, or they say there's going to be a lifetime warranty on the engine and transmission, 
Those are the kinds of things you definitely want in writing. You want all the documentation and you want to keep it for the duration of your lifespan with that car to make sure you're going to be getting what you paid for. And another red flag, of course, is sending money out of the country. And a lot of people say they would never do that, but you'd be surprised at what scammers can say to get you to send money out of the country. These guys have seven days a week, 24 hours a day to think about what they're going to tell you. Are they good at what they do? Absolutely. A lot of them are savvy and gone are the days where you could always tell a scammer just by grammar mistakes or because they have a heavy accent. Sometimes those are telltale signs, but a lot of times they'll sound like you and me. A lot of times they'll, they'll play like there's a legitimate reason for their phone call. Um, and a lot of times they will swindle people out of money that you think would be the last people on earth to be taken for a ride. Now, one of our most, uh, I think one of our most popular scams right now is the imposter scam. Just by a volume of calls that we get, it's the imposter scam where they claim that they're the IRS, or these days they claim they're social security and that they're going to take your number away from you and you'll never get benefits anymore unless you turn over personal information and money to them. And what with the social security version of this, they'll claim that your social security number has been used in the commission of a crime. They'll tell you that um, there's a lot of problems with your social security number, and they're going to uh, go on, go, go down and arrest you if you don't do what they say, or they'll tell you you'll lose your benefits. Um, imposter scams can run the gamut. I mean, they can say anything from I'm with the Flint Finley Police Department to I'm with the FBI, I'm with the IRS, I'm with the with Social Security Administration. Um, they're not, but uh, people don't realize that with the government, mostly you'll see a problem with the government um, through a letter you get in the mail, not through a call that you get um, just spur of the moment with um, no uh, with no um, real warning. Uh, the IRS, for example, never just calls people out of the blue. They'll start it out with a letter, and they might follow up with you on the phone, but um, these imposter scams are rampant. Fortunately, a lot of people know to hang up the phone. We try to get the word out with this type of scam, and people um, don't uh, don't typically lose money. But you'd be surprised with when you get um, an 85-year-old on the phone, or even a 25-year-old year old on the phone that doesn't really understand how all the government units work, or maybe they're newer to the country, or they've never seen this presentation before. Um, you bet there's a chance they're vulnerable to falling for a scam that. Um, that you've um, that you've encountered. So what we tell people in terms of the imposter scam is don't provide personal information, no matter what they tell you. If you know that you are talking to or think that it may be a legitimate individual from a legitimate government agency, hang up and call back using the real phone number that you know for the agency. Don't use a phone number that they leave on your voicemail because they do all this, uh, this preparation work and they'll have local phone numbers, they'll have phone numbers in Washington, DC, they'll spoof phone numbers, so they're using phone numbers on your caller ID that they really don't even have a tie to. Um, so if they tell you to call back a certain number, ignore it. Call back the number that you know for the agency that they're trying to represent. For instance, Medicare is 1-800-MEDICARE. Social Security, the FBI, these all these agencies have toll-free and or local phone numbers in areas near you that, um, that can be used to call back if you think somebody uh, may be a scammer, but you're just not sure. We don't want to get anybody in trouble, you know, for not paying their taxes or for um, a problem with, with a criminal issue. But I'm telling you, most government agencies will write you a letter. They don't have the time to call every, everybody out of the blue. 
So here's a little video. It's only about 30 seconds long, but it's just about um, how these scammers really aren't going to tell you what they're all about. If they told you what they were really doing, you'd hang up the phone. So they use these imposter scams and they cloak themselves in a whole kind of identity theft with, um, with what they're really trying to get from you. Here's a little video. Explain that to me again, please. All right, here's the deal. I'm going to pretend I'm with the IRS. I'm going to say you owe back taxes and threaten you with jail time. That'll scare you into giving me a whole bunch of your money. I also need your social security number, too, because then I can really take you to the cleaners. Unfortunately, it's never this obvious. That's why we're here, dedicated to protecting Ohio families against frauds and scams. Get the facts you need today at ohioprotects.org. And as you see on the screen, that is the best phone number for our office. I'll also give it um, at the end, but our office has a help center and it's there to help you and support you for your, um, you know, if it's to report a scam, that's wonderful. Not that the scam happened, but you really should report scams. Even if you don't think we can get to the bottom of it, it's important for an educational purpose and for our databases that we have record of the scam that, um, that welcome themselves into your life. Uh, we do realize there are a lot of annoying phone calls throughout the day, a lot of robo calls. In fact, we have a robo call enforcement unit now that started in March where we're trying to make Ohio the most difficult state to do business with for a robo caller. We always hate the scammers that are out there using phony phone numbers to call us at all times of the day. But now you can call that toll-free number that you see on the screen or go to ohioprotects.org or fax the word robo, I'm sorry, text the word robo, R-O-B-O, to 888-111. That is a way to report a robo call as well. And we'll send you back a form to fill out that takes less than two minutes to fill out this form so that you can report an illegitimate robocaller that has given you a phone call in spite of the do not call list if you're on that list, um, in spite of the fact that robocalls are, are highly illegal unless they're your school or they're providing you information that's relevant to you or you've given them prior written notice. A lot of these robocalls are illegal and they're out there to try to scam you. So now you have a, a website, a toll-free number, and even a text message code, 888-111, to text to robo, to um, 888-111, the word robo, that'll get you the form to fill out to report robocalls. So they're not always imposter scams. There's plenty of other scams we're going to talk about. But uh, one thing we've heard from throughout Ohio and that the Attorney General is very clued in on is the fact that we just can't put up anymore with these robocalls. The volume, the intensity, the fact that they're, you know, they're tying up our phone lines and taking up precious minutes that we'd rather spend with our family is certainly something we're well aware of. But the best protection itself is don't answer the phone. Unless you know who's on your caller ID screen, don't answer your phone because a lot of times they'll pretend to be someone down the street They'll, they'll use a 419 area code to pretend there's someone local, so they'll get you to pick up the phone that way. We also see a lot of fake check scams. I don't know if you've gotten a fake check in the mail yourself, but we get a lot of, um, a lot of work at home scams uh, manifest themselves with a fake check going to someone or um, an overpayment scam on Craigslist or OfferUp or some of those websites is pretty common as well. If, um, if someone's trying to give you more money than you want for an item and you haven't met them in person, a lot of times that's what we call the overpayment scam, where they'll send you a phony check, tell you to take the proceeds of that check and send it to a shipping agent or someone else they make up that's also involved in the scam. So let's say you're selling a tractor for $300 or a lawnmower for $300 online. And um, 
somebody's really interested. They claim to be from in the area, but they give you a song and dance about how they can't do business in person because they're out of the country or they're out of state right now, but they want to use a shipping agent to send, to have you send that lawnmower to them across state lines or in some other country. So they'll make up a story, write you a really large check. Let's say it's for $3,000. And they'll say, well, that's because the twenty, the extra $2,700 is meant to go to the shipping agent. Here's their information. Please deposit this check at your bank and then siphon off that money and send it to the other person involved in the scam. So it's kind of a convoluted scam. But the moral of the story is if somebody's trying to give you more money than what you've earned or what you want for an item, pay very, very close attention to that check. Go to the bank, ask questions before you just deposit it into your account. Never, never, never send off a portion of the funds for any reason if they're giving you an overpayment or if they're telling you that it's a mystery shopper project and they have to give you a few hundred dollars in as a part of a check. Um, that, those are all the red flags of a scam. So you can also call the bank issuing the check to verify that the funds are in the account and that you've gotten the check. And they might be able to tell you right there that they've had problems with that account. There's been fraud on that account. But um, I've gotten checks before in the mail at my home address. In fact, our former Attorney General Mike DeWine actually got a check at the Attorney General's office, FedEx overnight to him from a scammer not realizing it was a government office and claiming that that check's very important. Please cash it for me and send the proceeds back to me. All of, it's all part of a fake check scam. And these are some elements of a fake check. I really gloss over this slide because a lot of times the scammers are very savvy at making checks um, with no errors at all, other than the fact that it's a stolen account number and a stolen routing number and a, you know, a company they have no business writing a check on behalf of. But um, you know, sometimes they will make a misspelling. Sometimes the check will look too good to be true, but they want it to pass muster at the, at the teller window or through the ATM machine. So they'll make the check look very real. Again, they'll steal the account number. They might even say it's a cashier's check or a bank check to make it, uh, make it seem official. So they'll use, um, they'll use these fake checks that they buy at Office Depot or, or Staples. They're meant for small businesses, but they're abused by scammers. They'll have watermarks. They'll have all the telltale. Um, signs of a real check, but there'll be a fraudulent um, signature on there and it'll be a scammer doing his scam. Uh, we see plenty of prize and sweepstakes scams as well. Sometimes that's coupled with a fake check scam. They'll tell you that you've won a foreign lottery. Oh, but you need to pay taxes in advance of getting your reward money or your winnings. So they'll give you a fake check telling you that's to pay for the taxes. Then they'll give you someone else who's involved in the scam to send the taxes to with the proceeds of that check. Now, that doesn't always work that way. A lot of times they'll just imposter publishers clearinghouse or they'll make up a prize granting institution and pretend that you've won something, but they'll give you some reason to pay an advanced fee or an advanced tax or some charge in advance to be eligible for the prize. So never pay an advanced fee um, beforehand to get a prize. And if you didn't enter the contest, you probably didn't win. We have a lot of folks that claim to be winners out there because they've gotten a phony phone call uh, when in fact they don't even remember entering the sweepstakes because it was all a scam. So there was no sweepstakes, there is no prize. And if you pay money, Usually they're gonna want a Western Union wire transfer, or they'll want you to pay in iTunes cards or some kind of currency that we talked about as being a red flag. So those are your red flags of a prize sweepstakes scam. Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, no, you know what, I'll hold those to the end, to the end but uh, there's, there's a few that, that I'll, I've got some questions and some curiosities, I suppose, but 
Absolutely. Uh, definitely a lot of ground to cover here. And if some of these scams don't seem familiar, it's because they don't, you know, they, they don't happen every day to people. Um, they happen every day to our office because we get reports from, you know, thousands and thousands of Ohioans that get exposed to these scams. But they try to use different uh, variations of the scam. They follow the news. So if COVID-19 is in the news, if coronavirus is in the news, they may pretend to offer you something that will cure it. Or they'll pretend to offer you something because of COVID or that they can't, they can't see you in person because of COVID. So please give me that down payment on my vehicle sight unseen because I don't want you to get coronavirus. So they'll use these little nuances in the news as an excuse to not see you, to get for, to, for you to use some of this currency that they want you to uh, pay in. Um, we also see the romance of sweetheart scams. Now this is specifically targeting a lot of times older adults, but you better believe a lot of people in their 20s and 30s get scammed, not always through the romance and sweetheart scam, but some data came out not too long ago that showed that people in their 20s and 30s are scammed more often than older adults. It's just older adults get scammed for more money. So they let more money out of their pocket, but volume wise, we get a lot of younger individuals in their 20s, 30s and 40s that see the scams as well. Um, they may not report them, they may not lose very much money, but one of the scams that will cause an older adult to lose a lot of money is the romance scam, where they claim to be a local, uh, a local resident and they're traveling in another country. They'll tell you that they're an oil contractor doing business offshore. They'll tell you they're in the military and they're an officer and they're on, you know, they're on, um, on a base far away from the United States. They'll tell you they're a business consultant that's doing work in another country. Whatever they tell you, if you haven't met them on, if you haven't met them in person, pretend they don't exist until you do, because uh, you want to research someone you meet online because they have scammers. The scammers are in romance dating sites. They are in chat rooms. They are on message boards, and they will talk to you like you are their latest love interest, you are their best friend, you are their shining star, and it may even take a while for them to build trust up in you. They know that and they won't introduce money into the issue until days or weeks or even months into the relationship. They will string you along, pull at your heartstrings, and then finally they will start introducing money into the conversation. You'll never meet them in person, but um, they will tell you that someone close to them, uh, you know, a nephew or a granddaughter needs emergency surgery, or they're stuck in another country and can't cash their checks because they're an American citizen. They'll tell you all kinds of stories where that will convince some older adults to depart with their income, with their social security, with their money that they make through investments or through their pension. And so romance and sweetheart scams can happen at any age, but a lot of times it's the older adults that get into that trap. And they meet someone that sounds too good to be true, that gives a good song and dance about why they can't meet you in person, then they finally ask for your money. So talk to friends and family about online relationships, research someone you meet online. Uh, there are actually a lot of bulletin boards out there that will post the photos and the stories that scammers are telling you. So if something matches up to something that you've looked online and seen as a scam, you can match that up and know that it's a scam. You can do a reverse image search if you know how to do that. Um, through simple websites like Google, you could do a reverse image search to see if the photo they're using has been used in other types of scams or is posted anywhere else online. Um, lots of detective work you can do or your friends and family can do to help you determine whether someone is truly after your heart or whether it's just a scammer. 
then please don't send money to someone you've only met online. Um, no matter what the circumstances are, if they're, if they're online and telling you that they need money, no matter what the emergency is, don't send it. Be skeptical, think twice, don't send money to someone you've only met online. Uh, another another type of scam we see all the time is phishing. And phishing, when it's spelled a PH, like with a PH like it is on the screen, is phishing for personal information. That's where a scammer will maybe write an email that looks like an email that's coming from your bank or your credit card company. They'll tell you that your card or your account has been compromised and you'll never be able to use it again unless you click on a special link and give them your account number and your social security number and your pins and your passwords, all phishing. Those are all phishing mechanisms where they fish for your personal information to commit identity theft or to sell that information to someone else who will commit identity theft. So if you ever ask for personal information through an email or through a text message, or through a phone call and they say they're your bank, hang up. Call your bank at your branch, local branch or call the toll-free number you usually dial to get your real bank and verify that there's really something that's a problem with your account. Because a lot of times it'll simply be a, um, a, phishing, a phishing scam where they'll use, the, they'll use the logo of the business, the bank or the credit card company They'll use the phone number on your caller ID. That's why you can't always trust caller ID is because caller ID spoofing allows a scammer to put whatever phone number they want you to see on your caller ID machine. It's technology that's readily available to scammers. It hardly costs them anything to call internationally these days. And when they do, they will use that caller ID spoofing to fake the number that they're really calling from. So you'll think they're in your area of Ohio. Here's a little video. This is actually a pretty funny video. It's only 30 seconds long, but it talks about how ludicrous it is for these phishing scams to really be the bank or the credit card that they tell you they are. Coming. Good afternoon, Mr. Thomas. I'm from your credit card company. We suspect several unauthorized transactions on your card. Really? My credit card company? Yes, and we care about your security, so we make house calls. Good news is you give me your social security number, and we'll take care of you. Uh, is that all you need? Uh, oh, not quite. We also need your PIN number. <laughs> I forgot. What, what's that on your back? Nothing. Oh, I get it. You're fishing for my personal information, right? <laughs> no. So you can steal my identity, right? No. Then how come you have a fin sticking out of your back? Honey, get my tackle box and rod. OnGuardOnline.gov has tips to help you guard against internet fraud, to secure your computer, and protect your personal information. To be more secure online, log on to OnGuardOnline.gov. Stop, think, click. Um, as I mentioned, we see a lot of home improvement scams as well. Um, you may not know this, but in the state of Ohio, you are given a three-day right to cancel anything that someone's trying to sell you outside of their normal place of business. So if it's at a senior expo or a home improvement show or um, some type of door-to-door -door sales, you usually will get a three-day right to cancel. Now, a scammer won't tell you about your three-day right to cancel, but if somebody's doing sales for a living and they're going door to door, they will know that if they're in Ohio, they have to give you notice of your three-day right to cancel. So if they don't tell you that right then and there, that is a red flag. Um, one thing that we see that grabs a lot of people at just about every age these days is the computer repair scam. Now, I'll slow down a little bit and let you know about the ways the computer repair scam will work. First of all, if you get a phone call out of the blue claiming that someone is from Microsoft 
or a big another big technology company and that you have a virus on your computer, that is a scam. If they say they're calling from Apple and they want to fix your computer because it has viruses or if there's a problem with it being slow, that is a scam. Your computer may have viruses or it may be slow, but the person calling you out of the blue does not know that and they are simply trying to get you to get give them remote access to, to play like they're gonna fix your computer and then put malicious software onto your computer to steal your personal information. And not only that, they will charge you for what they say is virus protection and, and jobs they're doing for you under the guise of being a computer repair company. So be very careful about any calls out of the blue. Never allow remote access to your computer. And callers cannot tell you if a computer has a virus. Now, I know I'm going sort of quickly on this, but realize there are other ways this computer repair scam works. Number one is not only will they possibly call you out of the blue, they may put something on your computer telling you that you have a virus. If your whole screen turns red, or if something, something goes wrong and you're, you're getting a message saying that you should call a toll-free number because your computer has a virus, that is part of the computer repair scam. Never call that toll-free number. Go to someone local or go to an appliance store that fixes computers and get it professionally looked at to make sure that you don't have viruses. But if someone's asking you to do something out of the blue and, the, and they're calling you or they're telling you there's something on your screen to call a toll-free number, that's a scam. They'll also even impersonate Microsoft and these other companies by claiming to be them when you search for Google results. Who do I call for a scam on my Microsoft computer or with my Microsoft software? They'll buy an ad and unknowingly be listed as a sponsored ad when you search for tech support from a company. They'll be listed right up at the top as a sponsored result. So that's yet another way the computer repair scam can occur is by if you search for a company and you don't realize it's an ad and not a search engine result, you're prompted to call a toll-free number that's actually a scammer's toll-free number. We're going to watch a little video on this. Hello? Hello. This is uh, Bobby with Tech Support. Yeah, I'm just going to need you to give me complete access to your computer so I can pretend to remove a virus while actually taking all your personal and financial information. Oh, and I'm going to lock a computer so you have to pay me to access it. Sound good? Unfortunately, it's never this obvious. That's why we're here, dedicated to protecting Ohio families against frauds and scams. Get the facts you need today at ohioprotects.org. Uh, we see a lot of phony charities as well. Again, that's a whole different section of the Attorney General's office, but watch for some of your red flags, watch for high pressure tactics. Verify the legitimacy of a charity. I know the Better Business Bureau has an arm of their organization that does do reviews of charities and they will be able to help you ascertain whether a charity is, is legitimate. We have um, regulations of charities in Ohio. So if you're a charity, you need to register with the Ohio Attorney General's office. So you can go to that web link on the screen and, they, and we can actually help you determine whether someone is uh, up to date with their charity reports that they're required to do. We can let you know how much money is going towards administrative overhead instead of going actually to helping the people they are claiming to serve. So you can find out a lot of information before you give to charities, especially this holiday season. We also see a lot of job opportunity scams, advanced fee loans and grant scams, social media scams. A lot of these social media scams are sort of the same kind of scams we see in person and over the phone. They just perpetuate themselves through Facebook messages, 
um, LinkedIn messages, Twitter feeds, things like that. So they might start out as a social media scam, but really it's one of these age old scams. It's an imposter, or it's a phony grant, or it's a phony sweepstakes, something like that that's, um, that's really a miss. But a lot of times on social media, you have to be careful. If someone hacks into your friend's Facebook account, they may send you as a friend a message saying they're in another country and they've been stuck traveling and you know I'm good for the money, just wire me $1,200 and here's where I'm at, here's the hotel information, when it's all a scam. Nobody was really traveling anywhere and they just hacked into a Facebook account and just started messaging friends to try to get you to pay them money. Do I have about 10 minutes? I know I'm running a little late, but can I talk about identity theft for a few minutes? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, identity theft is rampant. So that's why we built identity theft into a lot of our other presentations, because this information is really important. You've probably gotten phone calls, letters, mailings saying that you've been a victim of a data breach. And that's terrible. We have lots of victims of data breaches that call us because they need our identity theft information about how to stop that from happening to them. Now, just because of the data breach doesn't mean you're a victim of identity theft, at least not yet, but it does mean you're vulnerable. Identity theft occurs when a person obtains and uses personal information without your permission to commit fraud. So if, if a system like Target, for example, Target was a victim of a data breach several years ago during the holiday season. Someone hacked into their network and was able to obtain customer information, including credit card numbers and other types of personal information about their customers. Now, those customers' information is out there for sale, it's potentially been used without their permission to commit fraud, but until it's actually used, you're not yet a victim of identity theft. You may be a victim of a data breach, but the identity theft occurs when they actually use it without your permission to open up a credit card or to get a medical procedure or to file taxes and claiming they need the refund at their, at their bank account number. We see lots of different types of identity theft in the state of Ohio. A lot of people think of identity theft as just being opening up a credit card or using your credit card number without permission. That's definitely an important um, aspect of identity theft, but there's lots of other types of identity theft as well. Um, some warning signs if you're denied credit when you know you have good credit. A lot of people these days know and have a good have a good good idea of whether they have good credit or bad credit. If you know you have good credit and you sign up for a charge card at Kohl's or you apply for a, an auto loan and they say there's a big problem with your account, that can be a sign of identity theft. Maybe somebody has ruined your credit without your notice and without your permission. Um, if you see unauthorized charges on your on your bill or you get bills in the mail that you don't have any account with. Those are things you don't want to ignore. Um, you want to dis dispute the unauthorized charges and you want to put yourself in defensive mode so you can take steps to make sure you aren't going to become further a victim of identity theft. You can get things like an, an initial fraud alert on your, on your credit accounts, you can, get a, um, you can get an overall credit freeze on all of your credit reports. Those are steps you can take to um, really protect yourself against identity theft. If debt collectors contact you, sometimes it's a scammer, like what I talked about with the lady in Delaware County where they gave her 45 minutes to act. But a lot of times, if it's a real debt collector and you don't recognize the debt, it could be an actual identity theft situation where somebody has run up the tab using your social security number. If you receive unfamiliar bills or you no longer receive mail, or are there errors on your credit report? That is a huge, huge um, 
red flag. If you see an account on your credit report that you've never opened, or if you see an account that should be closed and it's listed as still open, but owing money or being past due, those are some very good signs that you may be a victim of identity theft. Now, the good news is you can actually check your credit report from annualcreditreport.com for free. That is the website that came out of the legislation from about 16, 17 years ago. It gave us all the ability to check our credit report for free once a year. In fact, one good thing that the credit reporting agencies have done is while we're in COVID through April of 2021, so far, they're giving people online access to their credit reports every week instead of just once a year because people are more cognizant of identity theft they're home more often, they're doing a lot of work online, they're using their credit card probably online more than they thought they ever would. Because of COVID-19, you do have access to your credit report every single week. Again, that's through April 2021. But the website you need to go to for that is annualcreditreport.com. You can reduce your risk of identity theft by not volunteering information as readily as you sometimes might. Even if it's for a sweepstakes or a drawing or something, read the privacy policies of some of these websites that you submit your information to. They could be selling your information, they could be giving it out, they could have lots of marketing um, lead lists that they're gonna send that information to. It may start out as being legitimate, but then if scammers get a hold of those lists or if they get a hold of your information, you could be at risk for identity theft. You could be at risk for scams. Shred your documents. If anything has personal identifying information on it, make sure you put it through a shredder. Monitor your financial statements closely. Create a mail schedule. If you are sending in personal information through the mail, think about taking it to the post office instead of leaving it in your unlocked mailbox with the flag up. If you're like most of us, you have an unlocked mailbox that is a recipe for identity theft. If you put the wrong detailed information in there that a scammer might steal, especially if it's a long weekend or if you go on vacation, Know when the mail's going to show up, have it held at the post office if you know you're going to be away from home for a long, a long duration. And don't carry extra personal information with you, like your social security card. That is something that a scammer could steal. They could look over your shoulder. They could take your pocketbook and have that information readily at their fingertips. Um, just some online safety tips as well. We had already talked about being very careful with um, phishing, with credit card and bank emails saying that you owe them personal information. Usually those are a scam. But you also want to be aware of any unknown attachments, downloads, pop-up windows, anything you're not expecting, don't click on it because it could be malicious software. It could be designed to infect your computer and do everything from show you annoying ads all the way down to locking your computer up until you or unless you pay a ransom to the scammer. That's what's called ransomware. You want to install and update your antivirus programs and make sure, really concentrate on updating your software. Because if you don't have an updated antivirus program, it may not be able to catch the latest variations of viruses, and you may be duped into sacrificing personal information simply because you don't have a security patch or something that could be taken care of by the latest uh, version or the latest update with your antivirus. And also watch out for scam websites and emails. We've even seen one recently where they claim they are in need of your uh, password because it's been expired for a while. So they talk you into putting in your old password and new passwords when it's really not even a program or an app on your phone. It's just a scammer 
wanting to look like wanting it to look like they're wanting your password so then they can try to log in to websites with your credentials. We already mentioned how credit is going to be your most consumer protection when you're doing transactions online. You also want to make sure you use secure websites. Does everybody know how to make sure a website is secure? You want to look in the address bar, and if it says HTTPS at the beginning of the web address, that is a sign that it's a secure website. Or maybe there's a lock, or maybe your address bar turns green. Those are all signs that you're at a secure website. So only put your credit card number in, only put passwords in, only put any information about you in a website that is secure. And beware when you're using free public Wi-Fi. I've got a whole different presentation on cybersecurity, so I could go into this for another hour. But please beware and don't use free public Wi-Fi if you're going to be doing a financial transaction or logging into a website with a password or checking your credit report. Those are things you need to do at home, behind a firewall, with encryption. If you have a safe home network, that is where you wanna do any kind of transactions that require personal identifying information, not at the library, not at the coffee shop, not at the airport. And choose hard to guess password reset questions. Everybody talks about how important it is to have a hard to guess password. And that's definitely true, but also use a hard to guess reset question and answer form as well. If they ask you what question you wanna to use to reset your password, don't choose one that someone who knows a little bit about you would be able to easily answer. Like on the screen, it says right now, what is the first name of your oldest niece? That might be a tough one for a scammer to figure out, but what if they know your family background? What if they monitor your activities on social media? What if they see an obituary with your all of your nieces and nephews listed there? They might be able to hack into your account if you use that type of password reset question. Um, we did, uh, there's a really good article, I won't read through this, but there's a really good article in Reader's Digest from back in 2013, where a con artist actually wrote the article about how not to get scammed and about what kinds of mentality people have that successfully um, become victims of a scam. And a lot of times they simply don't have that skeptical attitude. They really look for what's in it for them and not, well, not what is in it for the scammer. For instance, um, they don't ask a lot of questions. They answer a lot of questions. So if somebody calls you up and says, I'm going to issue you a new Medicare card, and I'm going to make sure that it's, um, that it's laminated, that it has all your information on it, exactly what you'll need to continue using Medicare. Please verify your Medicare number with me so I can get your new card out to you. A victim would say, oh, wow, that sounds great. I need a new Medicare card. I'll answer that question. But a skeptic would say, wait a second. Why are you calling me? You can't possibly be calling every Medicare recipient in the entire country telling them that they owe you their Medicare number. So again, those are, those are questions they're not prepared for. They'll probably hang up the phone and go to a new victim. So don't ask a lot of, so you wanna ask a lot of questions as a skeptic. A victim would just answer the questions instead of really trying to see through to what the scam is all about. So this is my final slide. There's some always tips and some never tips about, um, about staying away from scams. Uh, first of all, you always wanna be skeptical. If you haven't learned that from me yet, please be skeptical. Research business and charities always. Beware of strangers who seek personal connections. Keep your personal information private and know that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And here are some never tips. You never wanna send money via suspicious methods. Remember we talked about 
wire transfers, MoneyGram, Western Union, um, gift cards, especially iTunes and Amazon and eBay gift cards. Those are fine to give to your family, but they're not fine to do business with unless it's with that actual website. Never give personal information. Never carry unnecessary personal information. Never pay to win a prize. Never allow a stranger remote access to your computer. And never pay the full amount up front, at least for a home improvement job. I guess we have to do that when we're buying gas or groceries, but never pay a full amount to someone who's gonna do work in your home. If they want payment in full, ask them why or go to another go to another contractor because they're obviously something wrong if they want the full amount 100 percent as an upfront payment this is our website ohioprotects.org you can file a complaint you can report a scam you can sign up for our wonderful um, consumer advocate newsletter um, you can also find out more information about the latest scams and about robocalls from ohioprotects.org. Right now on the front page, it is full of information to help protect you from those annoying robocalls. And there's our big website, ohioattorneygeneral.gov. And there's our toll-free number for all of our sections is 800-282-05. 1 5. And there are some other consumer resources, including the uh, Facebook and the Twitter handle for our office, and some really good organizations like the Better Business Bureau that um, you should probably bookmark on your web browser if you have internet access to make sure you're on top of what the latest scams are and making sure that companies you deal with are legitimate. Well, Ryan, that's uh, pretty thorough today, and you've got uh, the contact information there as well. I actually only have one follow-up question. You, uh, I started crossing out things as uh, as you were going through there. Um, yeah, the very early you mentioned food complaints. I'm just curious uh, what that has, uh, how your office deals with food complaints, or what types of complaints uh, that involves. Uh, in terms of food. Yes. Um, I mean, there, there would be a lot of health departments at the local level take care of food complaints, but sometimes we could handle a complaint in terms of someone buying or have, getting into a trial offer for a product or service or a food item, and they'll tell you it's a free trial, but in the fine print, mm -hmm. or maybe it won't even be disclosed, you're actually doing a per month subscription. So you could like be the getting Columbia something. House of Food. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of times they will disclose to you, but again, is it in the fine print? Is it even on the screen? A lot of people miss what they're truly signing up for when they try to get into a free offer or a trial offer. So it's really important that um, that people be aware of everything they might be purchasing and what advanced authorization you may be giving a company to buy, whether it's shampoo or an item like food. Um, you really want to make sure that you understand all of the um, all of what you're agreeing to, even if it says it's a free offer or a trial offer. Remember, if it's if it's too good to be true, it probably is. You may at least have to pay for shipping. A lot of times they will disclose that you have to pay for shipping, but what they may not disclose if they're not a legitimate business or if they're just trying to pull one over on you, they may not tell you that unless you cancel in a certain number of days, they're gonna mail you that product over and over and over again at a steep price. So that's where we have to work with companies if they don't have proper disclosures, and we can try to resolve complaints against uh, companies that have a practice like that. All right. Ryan, we appreciate your time today. A lot of eye-opening information. Uh, the contact information is there. And uh, I guess the, the take-home message is just be a little skeptical and you'll probably be okay. Absolutely. And we have a good relationship with most businesses. Most businesses do the right thing, just like most charities are out for the common good. But the bad apples are out there. 
watch watch for scams and hopefully you um hopefully you now are armed with a little bit of the ammunition to uh to say no to the scammer and to not fall for their illegitimate scams and fraud all right well for ryan lippy with the ohio attorney general's office i'm doug jenkins with the chamber of commerce thank you for joining us for this session about consumer scams